Okay, recording is on. Okay, once again, good morning and welcome to this class on uh, keys to supernatural ministry. Thank you, each one, uh, for connecting and uh, joining the class. Let's take a moment to pray and we'll get started. Could one of us uh, uh, please uh, pray? Pray for the class and we'll get started. All right, I'll pray. Our Father and our God, we want to thank you for this day. We want to thank you for another time and an opportunity to study your word. Father, we pray that you will open our ears and open our mind to receive that which you want to speak to us this morning, this afternoon, this evening. And we commit everyone onto your hands that you will give us an attentive memory of God, an attentive reasoning of God to be able to assimilate and be able to understand what the Holy Spirit will reveal to us through the Word of God. Father, we pray, Lord, at the end of this class, we will have every reason to glorify your name. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Son. Thank you, Holy Spirit, because we know that what we're going to hear right now will bring crow to go to your kingdom. Make us better Christians, ministers, pastors, evangelists. I pray, Father, that the word that we hear will God will bring life and understanding to every ears that hears it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And uh, welcome once again to this class on keys to supernatural ministry. Just to quickly um, review where we are and what we have been looking at. Um, we'll be learning about these eight keys um, uh, that, will, uh, that enable us to uh, manifest, enable us to work with God to demonstrate the supernatural. We talked about the importance of understanding the realm of the spirit, faith, uh, the power of the word. Then fourth, we talked about the renewed mind, how we need as believers to operate with the renewed mind. Uh, we talked about the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And then last class, last week, uh, we started talking about God's presence uh, and just, just learning, you know, different aspects about the presence of God and how uh, in the presence of God um, we can expect uh, healings, uh, expect the mir miraculous, the supernatural to take place, whether it's healings, deliverance, um, anything else. So uh, just quickly review on God's presence and then hopefully I want to finish um, uh, talking about the, the glory aspect of it, and then um, just mention seven and eight um, as part of um, the keys. Uh, and then we will talk about, we'll transition into maybe next week on talking about personal preparation uh, for, for ministering the supernatural. And I will release notes on the things I've been sharing with you uh, as we go along. So, just to quickly review about uh, the presence of God, uh, last week we, um, you know, we, we we tried to understand the difference between anointing, presence, and glory, uh, uh, and just just I'm just quickly reviewing some of the things we already said. The anointing is the presence and power of the Holy Spirit working through a human vessel, right? So the human vessel uh, is cooperating very closely with the flow of the Holy Spirit to minister to people. The presence of God is God moving on people, whether it's an individual or a, a collective group of people. God is extending himself, his presence uh, to them. And then in that presence, things happen. So to some extent, there is the receptivity of the people involved. In the anointing, it's like we are co-working, you know, with God. In the presence, we are recognizing his presence and we are responding or receiving from 
his presence. But God, but God is moving on us through his presence. And, and we do, you know, we, we, there is uh, some element of uh, our seeking, our desiring involved right? as, as an individual or as a group. God, I want your presence. I desire your presence. Uh, and then, so in relation to the presence of God, we, we mentioned several things. We talked about, you know, varying degrees of the presence, uh, varying expressions of the presence. Uh, we talked about, um, you know, how the presence of God manifests uh, the works of God. And so it's very important for us to uh, recognize and respond to the presence of God, both personally and corporately. So we, we covered all of that last week. And, you know, uh, there are times where, uh, you know, you can have a group of people who are in the presence of God and one person recognizes and responds. Another person is like, hmm, nothing's happening. But we're in the same environment. Example, uh, you could be in the same auditorium or you could be in the same service, you know, and one person is feeling overwhelmed by the presence of God, and uh, uh, they, they, you know, so many, so much is happening in their life, and somebody standing right next to is is oblivious to the very presence of God, and so there is that that element of recognition, recognizing and responding to the presence that is important, um, both personally and corporately and so we need to help people in that you know learn to recognize God's presence learn to respond to the presence of God now, otherwise like we gave the example last week you know somebody comes to visit your home uh, you may even invite them in but if you go away and are busy with other things you're going to miss the whole purpose of their visit uh, and that can happen uh, even uh, individually or collectively and God moves by his presence the glory of God is, is, is again an extension of God's presence. God is revealing himself, but in the glory there are visible manifestations uh, of the presence of God. If you want to look at it this way, you can say um, the glory of God is the presence that has become tangible, that's become visible. Yeah. So let's just talk a little bit about the glory of God and you know, how do we engage in that um, as with either personally or collectively as we minister and expect the supernatural to take place. So we see that, you know, in the, in the Old Testament especially, um, that the glory of God is expressed visibly in different ways. So some of the things that we are familiar with is... Uh, the pillar of fire, the cloud, the glory cloud that covered uh, the people of Israel as they journeyed to the wilderness. What was that? That was the glory of God. But it was revealed in, in a very visible way. Everybody could see the pillar of fire. Everybody could see the cloud that covered them. That was glory. It was the very nature of God. It was who God is being expressed in the natural world in a visible way, in a tangible way. So what is the glory? The glory is the very nature of God. It's who God is. But when it is expressed in our natural world, we then refer to it as the glory of God. We refer to it as the glory of God, but you know, God is always. So when Moses said, Lord, show me your glory in the, the 30th chapter of Exodus, he says, you know, uh, so again, Moses recognizes, you know, he says, Lord, we will not go with you unless your presence go with, goes with us. And God says, Moses, my presence shall go with you and I will give you victory. So God is assuring his presence. But then Moses goes on to say, Lord, I want to see your glory. Right? So there is... Yeah, Shri Kumar, you have a question? You want to say something? Yeah, Pastor, I just want to know, um, like as you said um, in the Old Testament that fire, the pillar of the fire was the the expression or the manifestation of the glory. 
So I just want to know that when the uh, when the when the time of Pentecost, when that fire, um, the tanks of fire came, can we also call it as the manifestation of His glory? And um, and um, yeah, and also that uh, the sound of the wind and the man, that is that's something I just want to know. Thank you, Pastor. Yes, yes. So any any tangible expression of who God is. We say the glory of God's revealed. Okay, so we like on the day of Pentecost, tongues of fire, the wind, the place being shaken, uh, Acts 4. These are expressions of the glory of God. So, you know, and so uh, there is no limit to what expressions God would choose to use. You know, why did he choose a pillar of fire? Why did he choose cloud? Well, he just chose to do that at that time. Uh, he could, he, God can do, use anything in our natural world because he created the natural world. He can use anything in our natural world as an expression of the glory of God. Right? So, there is presence and glory that we need to understand uh, 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 in relation to the supernatural, the, the receiving the supernatural. Okay, so on the day of Pentecost, they receive the supernatural. They, you know, they prayed in tongues, they began to prophesy, and so on. Okay, so uh, going back to Exodus 13, God assured Moses of the presence, and we've talked about the presence. And he said, my presence will go with you. But then Moses goes on. He's not satisfied. He says, I want your glory. I want to see your glory. And that, that's something to think about. Why wasn't Moses satisfied with the presence? Because God said, my presence will go with you. But Moses said, I want to see your glory. I want to see your glory. Show me your glory. Now, uh, I understand where Moses is. This is Exodus 30. It's almost uh, 40 years or 40 plus years approximately since his first encounter with the glory of God, the burning bush. So that was his first encounter with God's glory. There was a bush that was burning, but it was not consumed. That's the glory of God being. So when you say glory, it is God making himself visible in our realm, any way he chooses. Right? And he comes in those expressions to... do the supernatural, to do something, to do a work. Right? And so that's the work of God. And since the uh, burning bush, Moses has seen many expressions of the glory of God. Imagine journeying 40 years or about 40 years with the pillar of fire and the cloud by day, fire by night, I mean, you, you are seeing a visible expression of the glory of God. And so now you come to Exodus 30 where, you know, Moses, this is like the final leg, the final uh, part of the journey. And uh, Moses is um, saying, God, you know, I want your presence. God says, sure, my presence will go with you. But then Moses says one more thing. Show me your glory. That means the glory of God is, uh, and, and, and pardon my expression, but I'm just saying it for us to communicate, but it's a greater expression of God. Because like we said in the, in the presence, it's possible for people to miss it. Like we said, two people can be standing next to each other. They're in the same service or in the same environment where God's presence is. 
and they could be uh, a high degree of the presence of God. And one person is recognizing and receiving from the presence. The other person is like, hmm, what's happening? But in the glory, you are forced to encounter God. And I, and I, I use the word force respectfully. God is not overpower, you know, God is not uh, disregarding our will. But it is such an encounter with the person of God. So the, uh, let me put it like this. The glory of God is such an encounter with the person of God that you cannot question. In the presence you can miss, and people do miss, the presence of God. But when the glory of God is revealed, it's hard to miss. Moses is saying, show me your glory. And then God says, Moses, uh, I'm going to cover you. You're going to stand on the rock. I will cover you. And God says, I will make all my goodness pass before you. My kindness, my loving kindness, my tender mercies. I will make that pass before you. I will go before you. So, how is God's glory revealed to man? It is an expression of God's loving kindness, goodness, tender mercies. It's an expression of that. That man encounters the glory of God. Okay, so that's very interesting if you're uh, if you see how God responds to Moses' request, you know, show me your glory. He says, I'll make all my goodness pass before you, my loving kindness, my tender mercies. And, and so Moses is hid there in the rock. And, uh, you know, so I'm, I'm just quoting now uh, uh, Exodus uh, 33, sorry, Exodus 33 and uh, verse 19. He says, I will make, Exodus 33, 19, I will make all my goodness pass before you. Um, I will make, I will proclaim the name of the Lord. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So how is God going to reveal his glory to Moses? Through his goodness, through proclaiming the name. That means all who God is, uh, uh, his graciousness, his compassion. So the glory of God causes us to encounter the very person of God, encounter the goodness, the graciousness, and the compassion of God. Or, or, or different versions may translate these words a little differently. But really, essentially, you're encountering the person of God, then you're encountering his goodness or loving kindness, tender mercies of God. So, when you look, uh, when you trace the glory of God, there is a visible expression of God, whether it's a cloud, whether it's a pillar of fire. And people encounter the very person of God in, in that visible expression, whatever it may be. So, Saul on the road to Damascus, he had a bright light shine. He had an encounter with the person of Christ. It shook him up. It blinded him temporarily. But it changed his life forever. So that was an expression of the glory of God. God encountering Saul in his glory. Now, when we say glory, it doesn't mean like all of God is made available, but whatever is needed for that moment to do the work. We call it supernatural, but for God, it's him doing his work. Whatever he needs to do at that moment, there's a manifestation of the glory of God. So we must, as we minister, recognize 
the presence of God and recognize the manifestation of the glory of God and then respond to it. In the release of his presence, when you, now it happens when you are happy, when it happens to you personally or collectively, right? When you're ministering. If it happens to you personally, you have a responsibility to recognize his presence and to receive from that presence. Otherwise, you can miss it. You can miss the work that God came to do for you personally. The presence of God was there, but if you don't recognize and receive, you can miss. The same thing collectively. That is, when the presence of God comes in, that's why it's important for a leader uh, who's, 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 who's leading the service or the congregation, the gathering or the meeting to be sensitive and then to lead the people gently into res responding and receiving from the presence of God. The glory of God, when God is manifesting himself by his glory, it's slightly different. Here, like we said, it's an encounter. It, it just You just receive. Usually, you step out of the way, let God do what he's doing, and don't interfere. Don't disrupt. You know, just, just let God do what he's doing, right? So I see Kennedy's question here, the glowing face of Moses, the answer, is that an expression of God's glory? It's a yes, you know? So God was revealing, expressing his glory in that fashion. So when it comes to you personally, or when it comes to your ministering, if you recognize God is manifesting his glory in a certain way, very important. I mean, if you want to use an analogy from Exodus 33, hide in the rock. That means stay out of the way. Let God manifest his glory to whom he wants and how he wants. The problem is we become disruptors because we want to control. You know, we want to, uh, no, no, no. This is the time when you just, just announce God is doing something, receive. And you announce it because you know you're recognizing, you know, just as you announce in the presence of God, you know, the, the, I feel, you know, I, I sense the presence of God here as, you know, whatever you're sensing. You announce it, encourage people to receive. Same thing when the glory of God is being manifested, you flow with it, but remember to stay in the rock. That means stay out of the way. Let God be gracious to whom He wants to be gracious. Let him show compassion to whom he wants to show compassion. That is, proclaim his name to whom he wants to proclaim his name. And it's God is moving sovereignly by his glory. And it's just people are going to encounter God when they are touched by the glory of God. And many times we just have to announce, we just have to say, this is what God is doing, just receive. The, the visible expressions of the glory can come in different ways. You know, sometimes people may experience tangible things physically, like um, burning, heat, uh, oil coming on them, rain on them. Uh, yeah, they're just this we can be. There's, we, we don't put God in a box. It's however he wants. He's going to visibly make himself known to people, expressing his goodness, his compassion, proclaiming his name, revealing his himself to them. 
And so we just announce, you know, God is doing this, receive. So in God's presence and glory, uh, be sensitive and just announce this is what God is doing, receive, and people receive. People can have visions, people can have personal encounters that deliver them. Uh, people can have uh, uh, deliverances taking place, demons are being cast out and you are not rebuking the demons, it's just God moving on them with the glory and they are being delivered. Uh, other expressions can take place, you know, whether uh, financial needs are met or things happen, but God is moving to reveal his goodness, compassion, and his name to people. Okay, so these are realms that we need to continue to explore further, just to be open to how God wants to move. Right. Sometimes it could be a sweet smell, an aroma, you know, uh, and and we've had that happen. I remember a couple of years, uh, two years ago, when we were having our, you know, we used to do before the lockdown. We used to have these um, times of we call them Fridays of prayer. And I remember, I think it was the very last Fridays of prayer that we had. We were in our Bible college. So, place and um, we were just worshiping and a sweet aroma just began to fill the room and it came from one particular side and so I, I, I looked towards that side and uh, first nobody was standing there um, there were no there was no window open or anything so it's not like some some, something came in from outside. Uh, and yet there was a sweet aroma just moving into the room, like all of us were standing worshiping. And there's a smell coming in. And I tried to look at the worship leader. They, they, their eyes were closed. They were busy leading worship. So I couldn't say anything to them. And so then I looked at one of our pastors, who was uh, actually it was Selena. Yeah, she was standing right there. And I said, Selena, come here. Can you get that smell? You know, it's a very sweet smell just coming from the other side. You're just moving into the room, you know. And uh, nobody was there. It was one side of the hall. And the sm the a sweet room, I said, can you get that smell? And then she moved in that direction. She said, yeah, I can get it. And so uh, you say, like, why was God doing that? Well, just letting us know that he's pleased with what's happening, uh, just expressing his presence in that manner. Uh, and we just just continued in worship, just continued in, you know. And so in those moments, God encounters individuals the way he wants to encounter them. Like what we read in Exodus 33, he says, you know, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. So what happens in the glory? Different ones are touched differently the way God wants to touch them. So we are in that same environment where the glory of God is being manifested. But he said, Exodus 33, 19, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. I will have compassion to whom I will have come. That means in the glory, God is sovereignly encountering people as he wants to. So, uh, you know, we are only, we are just standing there. We are not doing anything. You know, yeah, under the anointing, you are laying hands, you're praying, you're ministering. Or, under the glory, you're not doing that. You're just making sure you're staying out of the way. You're not interfering because God is being gracious to whom he will be gracious. God is showing compassion to whom he will show compassion. God is just doing what he wants. He's proclaiming his name to whom he wants to proclaim his name. And in that same glory, different people can encounter God in different ways. Right? But all we do is we recognize and we say, okay, God, have your way. And we can tell people, you know, 
this is what's happening, receive. And uh, he may just come to bless the hearts of people. He may just come to revive people. He may just come to break chains. He may come to just deliver people. You know, it was, uh, different things will happen to different individuals in that expression of the glory of God. Okay? So, God's presence and glory. Any questions before we do seven and eight? Okay. So, the last two things I will just mention, uh, keys to supernatural. Uh, and number seven is proclamation and action. So there are times when the supernatural is released and, uh, because we just proclaim something and we tell people to act, right? Uh, you find many times Jesus doing that in his ministry. You know, he would just say, stretch out your hand. He would say, go, you know, he would tell them, go wash, put play on the eyes, go wash in the pool of Siloam. Rise, take up your bed and walk. Uh, he's giving a, a, a proclamation to do something. And when people do it, there's a supernatural, there's a miracle that takes place. The need is met, something happens. So you proclaim that, you know, and now that, that, that proclamation, the word that you have to proclaim can come in many ways, right? It could come as a prophetic inspiration to you that the Lord says, you know, just say this. Uh, it could come as a word of wisdom. So you just say, tell them, so, you know, you, you say what you, feel inspired by God to say. So number seven is this. There are times when God will inspire you to make a proclamation that leads people to a certain action. And when you speak that and they act in line with that, a miracle will take place. And we understand that both in the Old and the New Testament that uh, mir many miracles happened through proclamation and action. You know, when they were before the Red Sea, God told Moses, Moses, tell the people to go forward. So can you imagine, actually at that time, uh, Moses came in, a, in Exodus 14. It says, you know, Moses standing before God. Oh, Lord, what do I do now? And Moses, God tells Moses, Moses, don't cry to me. Tell the people, go forward. So there's a proclamation for action, right? And as uh, you can just imagine, like, you know, the people come to Red Sea, they look up to Moses. Moses, what next? Go forward. I mean, go forward. Yeah, go forward. So they start walking. And what happens? The sea parts. So there's a proclamation for action. And as people start doing that, the supernatural begins to take place. So, Seven, God works like this. He gives you a word. Remember, it's an inspired word. Where you proclaim, call for action. It's a proclamation action. I say, do this. It may be to an individual. Maybe to somebody else. And as you proclaim, and they start acting, they experience the supernatural. So in today's world, it may, you know, maybe somebody comes to you with a problem and as you're talking to them, they're talking to you and God just drops something in your spirit. They tell them to do this. So you proclaim. Say, hey, go do this and this. And as they go and do that, they act on the proclamation. A supernatural work takes place. Why? Because the word was given to you by God you proclaimed, they acted, the miracle happened. And lots of miracles in the Bible, you'll find the sequence. Okay, so that's a simple key to the supernatural. The key is to recognize that God is giving you something to tell, right? That, that there's, there's an inspired word coming to you. And when you have that, rec when you recognize that, then you know you can boldly proclaim. And when people act on it, they will receive the miracle. The last one, number eight, is persistence. 
So here's an important key to the supernatural, which is there are times persistence itself is the key. I think a classic example of this is in 1 Kings chapter 18, when God tells Elijah, Elijah, he says, you know, go and tell King Ahab, it's going to rain. Now we know this can, you know, this applies to us as well because uh, over in James 5, James quotes this, uh, this whole, you know, incident. But God tells Elijah, tell King Ahab, it's going to rain. So the word has come, he proclaims it. But now Elijah goes up the mount and he starts praying. This is in 1 Kings, the 18th chapter. And we know something about the prayer that happened. He prayed seven times. Now we don't know how long each time of prayer was. We don't know. Could it be 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, one hour? I don't know. It just tells us, you know, to the end of uh, uh, 1 Kings 18, it says he bowed, first, I'm looking at 1 Kings 18, 42. He bowed his head and between his knees. James says he prayed. He was a man like, like passions as we are, and he prayed. So he bowed his head between his knees and he prayed. And um, we don't know the time. But what is brought out for us is this persistence, the fervent prayer of a righteous man, the heartfelt, fervent persistent prayer. So he prayed seven times. And after that, so seventh time he said, when the servant comes back, he says, okay, now there's a cloud. There's the size of a man's fist. So Elijah says, okay, the clouds come. I mean, the visible expression of the fulfillment of the word has come. So between the proclamation, God spoke, Elijah proclaimed, to the supernatural beginning to take place, there was persistence. So persistence is a key. That means you don't give up. And how you express the persistence, whether it's through prayer, whether it's to, through the confession of the word, whether it's uh, whatever, you know, that, that is key. You, know, you hold on. God has spoken. I have his word. It's going to happen. I have proclaimed it. It's going to happen. But I'm going to be persistent till I see it beginning to happen. So the moment Elijah saw the cloud, he said, okay, it's beginning to happen. Now let me get ready. Go home because it's going to pour. But proclamation, promise, persistence. He didn't give up. Now, of course, people will ask, you know, and how long should I be persistent? Well, until you see the promise beginning to be fulfilled. How long is that going to be? I don't know. Is it going to be seven times? Is it going to be three times or five times or seven times? I don't know. All we know is persistence is the key in that situation. And you and I must be determined. We're going to get it. Why? Because God spoke it. God spoke it. He's not a man to lie. His word is truth. He will fulfill his word, but I need to be persistent. What if you die without seeing the promise fulfilled? It's okay. At least I died in faith. Rather than die in unbelief, you have a choice. 
but isn't that a bad testimony? Not for me, because our report comes not from man, our report comes from God. And Hebrews 11 says, you know, talking about the Old Testament says, these all died in faith, not having seen the promise, but they all obtained a good report. And that's what we need. Yeah. So, yeah, I see Anita's question. When God spoke it, why was, you know, why was Elijah praying it? This teaches us a big lesson that God, we are co-workers with God. So that God speaks to reveal his mind. He invites us to work with him to see it fulfilled on earth. John Wesley went as far as saying, God will not do anything on earth without involving man. And I'm putting it in my own words, but that's exactly what he, I mean, that's, the, what, that's what he said. And God will not do anything on earth without involving man. So it really tells us that God reveals his will. When he speaks, he reveals his will, but then he engages with us to see that word fulfilled. You know? So it's, we are co-workers with God. There will be times God moves sovereignly, but in the normal things that he wants to work on earth, he engages with man and through man. Right. So persistence is a key. Uh, uh, all I can say is, you know, there is no set formula for this. You and I make the choice to be determined to see the promise fulfilled. Whatever it takes, you say, God, I'm going to see this word fulfilled because you spoke it. I want to see the work happen. Right. Uh, can persistence be seen as lack of faith? Kennedy's question. Uh, if no answers. Uh, so maybe the question is, is the delay happening because of a lack of faith? Um, well, actually what happens when we are being persistent with the word of God, we are being brought to a place where our faith is being matured, you know. Uh, you know, uh, our faith is being matured as we are uh, engaging with the word. So I, I would say that if we are being persistent, rightly, holding on to the word, then our faith is actually being strengthened during this time. Faith is being brought to a place of maturity, right? Uh, it's like what it says in James 2, that by his works, Abraham's faith was made perfect. Uh, I think it's in James chapter 2, verse 22. By works, faith was made perfect. This is, is, is his faith came to a place of maturity where it could produce right, by what he did. Okay. So when we are... So I see Anita's question, what should we do? What should we pray in waiting on the word? So when you're waiting on the word, you, you just declare the word, you affirm your faith in the word. You thank God for the fulfillment of his word. Uh, you praise him, you wait upon him, you speak your faith, you speak the word, you continue that way, right? So you continue by speaking or declaring the word. You continue by affirming uh, your faith in the word. You continue by praising God and thanking him for the fulfillment of his word. Uh, you continue just praying in tongues, letting the Holy Spirit pray through you towards the fulfillment of that word. So the Holy Spirit knows how to pray uh, and knows what we should be praying for. So just say, Lord, I'm praying for the fulfillment of that word. So we are persistent. We're not giving up. And we begin to see the promise fulfilled. Okay, so what we've gone through so far are eight keys that are important in seeing the supernatural manifest. I'm not saying this is a formula or, uh, you know, but the, these, this is how we engage with God to see the supernatural happen. And I'm just reviewing now. Number one is we understand the realm of the spirit. We understand that the spiritual over, can override the natural. So we are operating from that. Second, we operate in faith in God. We believe God. 
Third, we depend on the power of his word. We believe that this word that God has given to us is powerful. It, everything in the natural is subject to God's word. Four, we operate with a renewed mind. That means we learn to take on the ways and thoughts of God. And we are operating in that realm with a renewed mind. Fifth, there's the flow of the anointing. So when you and I recognize the flow of the anointing, we minister under the anointing. Uh, we let the anointing work through us. And of course, we'll be released through the gifts and so on. Uh, number six, there's the presence and the glory of God. So we need to be sensitive to God's presence, God's glory, and to respond to that. Because when we respond correctly, we will receive. Uh, number seven, there's proclamation action. There are times God gives us a word and we proclaim and act on it or proclaim and let, tell somebody to act on it. Proclamation action. And number eight, we are persistent in our pursuit of the fulfillment of the word of God. And that persistence is a key. You know, and sometimes um, uh, we, you know, I'm just thinking of one testimony by uh, I can't, I can't remember the person's name. Anyway, this pastor. So he talked about praying for a person who'd gone into coma. Now, you know, thank God that there was life support, and you know, the the the, the hospital did their part in uh, providing life support or care. But this pastor kept praying. Yeah, you know? and he'd go, and I think it was a long time, like eight months to eleven months. And, and then the person came out of coma and was brought out. But the pastor kept praying, kept ministering uh, for that person. Now, I know people will say, well, that just happened. Or we could say, well, the pastor prayed and was persistent uh, to see this happen. Or there are other examples where, you know, uh, some something happened. And they, they prayed through the night. And then in the morning, why did it happen at the very beginning? I don't know. But they persisted and they saw the miracle. So there is no formula here, but persistence itself is a key. And there are times we need to engage with persistence to see the miracle of God. Right? I'm not saying every time it's going to happen like this, but there are times. There will be many times when Things happen by the presence. Things happen by the glory and it just happens instantly. And there are times when we have to persist by faith to see the miracle. But the beautiful thing is at the end of each of this, whichever way, whether it's the anointing, whether it's a spoken word, whether it's a step of faith, whichever, whatever key we are using, now whatever key we are engaging with, the beautiful things at the end of it, we see the work of God and we know it's only God who did it, and uh, it's the work of God, and there's a miracle taking place, right? So I will write these things up, put it out there for you, for us, and then um, next week, what we want to do is we want to talk about personal preparation, right? So we'll change a little bit, saying, what can I do personally to position myself to be used by God in the supernatural? So we talk about these things, and um, these are things we are learning we continue to, you know, seek God, continue to pursue God, and and I'm sure that you know, as we learn, we will grow in uh, the experience and the expressions of the supernatural. Okay, any questions before we close off today? All right. Let's pray. Let's take a moment to pray together and we will then dismiss. Can somebody lead us in prayer? And uh, we will dismiss after that. Can I pray again? Go ahead, Harrison. Go ahead. Our Father and our God, we want to thank you want to bless your name, want to give you all the glory because 
Your word in and bring it life and bring it understanding and added no sorrow. Mm. Father, we thank you because we know that in you there is freedom, in you there is liberty, in you there is joy. Father, we are praying that you will give us the grace of God to experience the supernatural, even as an individual. So that we may understand oh God, what it means, oh God, to live in the supernatural. Father, I pray, oh God, that you will also help us, oh God, to see the fullness of your power. Manifesting in our lives, manifesting in the lives of everyone, oh God, that we disciple, that we, that we fellowship together with. Father, we are asking, oh God, that you will help us, oh God, to see beyond who we are mm. and live in the abundance, oh God, of the supernatural life. Father, we are thanking you this day that the words that we've heard, oh God, shall not just drop void, mm. but Father, oh God Almighty, it shall spring forth, oh God, living waters out of our lives. I thank you, Father, because that the word that we've heard today, oh God, shall bear good fruits in our lives, mm -hmm. shall bear good fruits in our ministries, shall bear good fruits in our families, in our homes, in our businesses, in our jobs, in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Father, because I know that the words that we've heard today were God. We expand, O oh God, our minds, O oh God, to see beyond who you are. Father, I'm asking, O oh God, that the grace of oh God not to depart from this supernatural grace given to us. Mm. Help us, O oh God, to run this race to the end. Help us, O oh God, to live this life to the end. Help us, O oh God, to act accordingly, O oh God, to your will and the abundance of your supernatural power. That, the, that your name alone will be glorified. Help us, O oh God, to fulfill purpose. Help us, O oh God, to do, that, to do that which you want us to do. Help us, O oh God, not to depart, O oh God, from this supernatural grace that you have bestowed upon every life, O oh God, that is present here this morning, this afternoon, this evening. I thank you, God, for your servant whom you've used, O oh God, to speak to us. Thank you, Father, because we know that virtue has gone out of him. But, Father, you replenish him and bless him beyond human imagination. Bless his ministry. Bless his workers. Bless oh God, you know, even his present and the future. In the name of Jesus. I thank you, Father, because I know that at the end of the day, we shall all make heaven. We don't want to hear these words of God, and we are nowhere to be found. But Father, we pray that the words of God that we're here today shall help us, O God, to touch lives and draw people, O God, to your kingdom. Blessed be your holy name, Heavenly Father. For in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. And I'll see you again soon. God bless you. God bless everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Beulah. God bless. Thank you, Rupa. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you.